I would like to kind of uh, circle back to some of the political infighting in China uh, real quick, because I'm wondering, like, do you have any sense that, do you think there'll be like some kind of climactic conclusion to that? Like uh, Xi Jinping will bring out Jiang Zemin in chains, or will there be like any kind of like, you know, moment when we see like, oh, it's wow, over. It's over. I, I think the most obvious one for that is is Jiang Zemin's age. I mean, he's uh, what eighty three now. Oh, he's no, 90, he's like in his nineties. He's ninety five, I think. Yeah. He's really yeah. Look, it's not long for the world. You know, it's just it is what it is, and um, I think that it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens then once Jiang Zemin passes, because um, clearly Hu Jintao doesn't seem to wield the same type of leverage or influence over the technocrat wing of the party that Jiang has been able to, uh, who was not never really known as being someone who was uh, confrontational. Um, he was always seen as sort of just a, as a kind of a minder of the party, rather, you know, and, and one other member of the Politburo Standing Committee, um, whereas where she has really diminished the power of the Standing Committee. Um, and, you know, you can see some people trying to bring that back. But I think that once Jiang goes, He'll get the state funeral. I think that he'll be, you know, he'll get the funeral with full honors. And at the after that point, it's Xi's party. Yeah, I do think Hu Jintao is just like out of it. He's like, he's letting his hair grow white. He's just glad to Which be is huge, alive. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, seeing yeah. Hu Jintao with white hair um, when they rolled him out uh, for the anniversary celebration, I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. Yeah, I think only like Zhu Rongji did that, let himself go white. Yeah, it wasn't even that white. Like usually, because you know, it's such a it's such a like oh the the black hair dye thing that you know when Zhou Yong Kong was put under, like he was arrested and then he showed up in court with white hair. That was like a symbol that he didn't have power anymore, right? Because hey, he didn't have the hair dye. It's so true, and it's it's funny that like I feel like people don't talk about that as much, but for some reason it's just become this this thing in in the mainland in taiwan not so much but in the mainland that uh, you know black hair dye it's everywhere and definitely within the party it's almost like allowing it to go white is a signal either that you've you've lost power or that you're you're no longer contending power right you're no longer wielding your power I was just thinking, like, what if this is what takes down the Chinese Communist Party? Like how ancient Rome, there was the problem of, like, you know, lead cups. <laughs> if, like, there's something in that hair dye that's just going to screw them up. <laughs> uh, the whole Politburo taken out by, like, uh, lead-laced black hair dye. That would be a great history book. History of the future. That would be the real uh, the real CIA operation if we actually had, like, a functional... Um, intelligence service that you know sending up there and sw switching the hair dye in Zhongnanhai while you know well or you, you know you don't have to go in with sheets you have to find like the uh you know whichever one of his servants is the one that brings it to him right you know it's probably probably some girl and you you go to her and you pay her obviously you have to you know maybe you even hire right maybe you hire the person that goes and brings that in this is this. this I mean, this really sounds like a great plot of uh, Deep Space Palace. Nine. <laughs> this sounds like like all yeah, those failed CIA operations to take down Castro in Cuba. Mm. Like, wasn't there some plot about like the CIA had this idea that if they could shave his beard, then he'd lose his power? That's actually right. That's that's right. There was there was a way they wanted to shave his beard. Um, there was an exploding cigar plot that they tried at once. Yeah. Uh, at one point, of course, Bay of Pigs is probably the biggest. Um, uh, the biggest one, also a complete failure. Um, though that being said, you know I'm not, I'm not as uh, against you. You know the United States taking military action like that in in the Americas, right? You know I think the Middle, you know, America plays you know this this role of sort of you know oh let's do regime change in the Middle East and it it always gets screwed up and it always leads to all these issues. But you know that's so far away. Whereas here in our own backyard, you know, you've got Mexico controlled by cartels, you've got Cuba controlled by uh, communists or a, a middling communist regime at this point, you know, you know that these are areas that the United States should wield influence over. Yeah. Take over Canada. Get rid of Trudeau. <laughs> Canada as well. Yes. You know, talk about, I mean, you look at the, the oil fields of Alberta, right? You know, I'm, I'm much more interested in those than I am in Iraq or Afghanistan. That's a good point. If we're going to have a war for oil. Let's... Let's fight Canada. Yeah. Actually, from like, what I- South Park had it right. <laughs> well, from what I hear about the people in Alberta, they might. Uh, yeah, exactly. 
But of course, right, China doesn't want us talking. She doesn't want us talking like this, right? Because we're not supposed to actually develop our own areas or like Alaska, you know, massive amounts of, of resources up there. By the way, also rare earth elements that are in rare earth minerals that are in Alaska. This is also why you heard in the previous administration, Trump was talking about buying Greenland, right? Well, and everybody poo-pooed it. Everyone said it was stupid. Well, who went in and started buying up all the mines in Greenland? It was China, of course. Well, it makes me think about how recently, um, you know, Xi Jinping was talking about like how, you know, limiting emissions is, is it's good, it's important, but as long as it doesn't interfere with the normal life, we still have to uh, ensure energy security. I mean, that's just smart. Yeah, it is. But like, you know, how like, you know, John Kerry talks about how we have to work with China on climate change. It's clear that it's like they're using climate change as a weapon against the United States. I never saw actual pollution until I went to China. You know, I've been all over the United States, but then I went to Beijing. The first night I was ever in Beijing, a actual acid rain. Like I remember growing up in the 90s and when thinking that acid rain was just like a common occurrence that you had to be like on the lookout for. Same as quicksand. Like I always thought that, you know, <laughs> quicksand would play much a, lar a much larger role in my life than, it, than yeah, I don't think I've ever actually seen quicksand. But um, the very first time that I ever saw actual acid rain was the first night I was in Beijing. I remember I was wearing a white shirt. And of course, I wanted to go to Tiananmen Square because, of course, and, you know, it started raining and just destroyed everything I was wearing. I mean, there is pollution in America. I mean, have you been to Los Angeles? Yeah, but that's that was nothing like I saw in 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 Beijing. I mean, you can see that sort of has that like haze when you're in if you're in the Hollywood Hills and you're looking out across Los Angeles. But it was nothing compared to what I saw in Beijing and certainly the, and living in Shanghai. I remember like the 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 best day in Shanghai, the best weather you would get in Shanghai, the sky would be kind of like, um, you know, sort of like a post-apocalyptic post orange almost, or or some kind of shade of, shade of gray. You know, they, Los Angeles, you can go to the beach, you can have, you know, bright skies, the, the water's blue, not brown. Um, it, it, it was night and day, total night and day. Yeah, my, my, one of my Biggest memories about Beijing is just you stepping off the plane and you immediately can't breathe. Exactly. Yeah. I had a friend um, who was a, a, a foreign exchange student um, and he came from China. He was living in Shanghai. He had had psoriasis his entire life, right? He was taking, taking all kinds of medicine for it, um, comes to, to NYU and within, I think, like two months, just completely cleared up. That's amazing that the human body can heal itself so quickly if you just remove the toxins. <laughs> it's, yeah, when there's no toxic air surrounding you.